I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Welcome to our meeting. Our meeting is uh, a uh, joint meeting. Oh, yes. Um, it is joint of the, uh, the select board and the uh, old academy building committee. And the uh, agenda is to have these guys uh, go first. And those guys should introduce themselves to the Zoom audience. Oh, yes. okay. and it's on you. Steve Brown. Larry Bucci. Thank you. It helps the ladies kind of take the notes. <laughs> okay, well, I guess I'll start. Um, again, Don Hudson, chair. Um, been in town for 35 years and um, wanted to join the committee primarily because I have a penchant for old buildings. It hurts my heart. You know, some beautiful buildings that have been standing for 166 years, like this one, um, in the disrepair that is in, is still standing, and uh, you know, to make sure that it can be continued to be used. I think it's important. Um, my forte is basically the same. I've been in town for 35 years, also. And I joined the committee because I wanted to change and renovate that building. I think it's going to be a cool old building when we get it done, you know, as much as we can afford to do. You know? And it's it's sad that it's sitting there in the condition it is with the leaky roof and stuff falling down and things like that. But hopefully we can bring it back to the glory it used to be. And I just wanted to add that Steve has 40 years of, of you know expertise in construction at Peachy Builders. So, and Dawn likewise has a lot of uh, expertise in construction, especially in masonry. So we're very lucky to have these two people on the committee because they understand the language, they know what they're talking about, and they um, can deal with architects and the uh, construction management company that we're dealing with in a very knowledgeable way. And I just feel that the history of the building is important for the town. And I have a feeling that this can help generate income for the town in the future. Uh, most places there, there's a rich uh, historical presence that they seem to attract tourists and people are interested in moving to towns like that to retire. So the reason we have you in is to get a, a, a project status update. So if you're prepared to do that, it would be very helpful. Well, I think um, I, I wasn't told that. Um, I was invited to come in and you know, talk about the, the project. Um, I was under the impression that the, the board has questions for us. Um, we tried to uh, anticipate what those would be. And that kind of is the format that we prepared ourselves for. We're certainly happy to, to uh, bring you up to date on the fact that I believe that we have um, the whole committee chose very wisely the uh, design team. Um, they are very well versed in the buildings of this age and what we're trying to do. Um, uh, Paul Lewandowski and, and uh, John Tura have wonderful ideas um, and, you know, I think will be invaluable. We were, out of four, they were wonderful. Um, they've also helped us um, work with, through um, looking for a construction manager. We've hired, um, brought on board, I guess you could say, um, Nickerson and O'Day. They're out of um, the Bangor area, pretty much up north. Um, Nickerson and O'Day has a rich history also of working with buildings of this size, some smaller, um, some larger, with towns, 
um, and not just a, a hit and run, just do this and go. They've worked with many towns over the years on many different phases of projects. They are highly skilled at doing value engineering, and that's going to be especially important now because from when we took our vote and, and set the budget, um, you know, we're, I'm dealing with, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50% cost increases in my company. And, and so having their expertise, some of the information they showed us during their interview was very impressive. They, it's all electronic where we can um, maneuver and manipulate, um, you know, ideas um, for what we need versus what we want and maybe how to plan for the future because our budget is obviously stretched because of the economy. So we know that what we what the potential is, is you know, to have a really fabulous um, product, but it's going to have to be phased. And it can, it, it can end at this phase. It, can, it depends on what the town wants. But they're, they're very capable in looking at what the necessities are, and, and they work really well with the design team, what the necessities are, what the necessities will cost, and um, what future opportunities are. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty much it. So they, again, it would be helpful if you could tell tell everyone where we are right now in the process. Um, what where we are right now is just reviewing, and I I had the set of drawings to bring uh, with me that we've reviewed recently um, within the last what, couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, the drawing of 1856 building and what the potential is. Um, I can, since I forgot to bring it with me, I can uh, get everybody's email or the chair's email and send you that. Um, so we're looking at the preliminary drawings of the draft opportunities. Um, of course, as everybody's probably noticed, um, the demo is done um, to a degree. We well, that, and that's that's kind of what we want to get a get a sense of. It's done to a degree, so we want to understand: is it done to the completion of demo? What's the plan for finishing the demo? You know, we need to understand that yeah. first off. I guess there's a lot of questions around that. Oh, I understand that. I've heard. Well, well, basically. I don't know if any of you watched because you saw the size of the equipment those guys were using to take it down. We didn't want them to get really close to the edge of the original building. The plan was for them to stop five feet from the edge of the 1856 building because one little mistake with one of those excavators, you could do more damage than you could ever repair to the original building. That's why you see ragged edges and stuff like that sticking out there. Once the construction manager gets on board, then they're going to, as we call it, surgically remove the last of the stuff that's sticking out off the side of the building. And then at that time, then we'll worry about how we're going to finish off the exposed ends where the looks, looks ragged now because that's where the old building was. So when you're complete, when the demo is completed, am my understanding that all that will be left is the 1856 building, the original building? Yes, from at, at, at the moment, what they're doing is um, the um, construction managers are coming up. They're working right now on the different items and the cost of different items to give us for our next meeting our preliminary estimate, and that will give us an idea of what the costs are for you know for basically in the construction fashion finishing those ends, getting that surgically removed stuff done. Um, and that's the goal is to have the 1856 building tidied up. Um, I understand that there are questions about the foundation, and I think, you know, Larry, do you want to speak to yeah, that? Yeah, I will. So that means we're spending more money, correct? If, if, this, if this surgically removal of the rest of the new building has not been done and you're getting prices, I'm not getting prices, but that's part of the construction management responsibility. So that's part that's, of the that's job. included in what was already what has already been done. Well, that, that De demo, price. demo, describe demo. Well, the, the demo was the bids and everything for the demo were to come up to that five foot D mark, if you will. Okay. And then everything from there on in 
was planned to be taken care of during the construction phase. Because demo is this what is going on with an old building is exploratory. Right. We didn't we didn't want the big machine right. near the building, and so yes, what is left is is a rich is the original plan for the mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's what that's what was discussed right out of the gate because we can't have the machine getting any closer. So that is part of the original scope. Yes. So if I'm if I may, what I'm hearing you say is that the RFP for the demolition company included the specification that says stop at five feet. Yes. And we didn't, we didn't, we're, we're not paying extra. We just didn't pay them for right. that piece. So of they, the they completed what was in their RFP for the amount of demo they were supposed to do. You know, and then the last surgical part, as we say, is going to be done by the construction management group and they're as part of the as part of the project. So it's not like it's going to be a cost overrun to do that extra demo. That was planned from it's the not a, it's not an unanticipated cost. No, 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 it was planned for no, it, it has to be because you never know in these old buildings what's going to happen. Right. So. so speaking of what we can't what 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 we never Anticipated, tell us a little more about the foundation piece. Well, that was a discussion again, it would be an anticipating saving money. Okay, that was because the the building as it's done right now, how do we prepare it to be something more? Maybe down the road. Maybe it will stay as it is when, when we get done. Who knows? But maybe it won't. So what would the possibilities be? And one of the things that you know I've heard, and when we did when we were on, on the reuse committee before this building committee, um, was you know warming station, for example, that would require um, showers, a full kitchen, a commercial kitchen. Well, we can't afford to do those right now. So what what would in, what would be involved? Likely um, putting an addition on. Well, there's a, a portion of the foundation. That is in good shape. It was a daylight basement, if I'm not mistaken. So why pay to tear it down and then to put it back in at future cost? So that was part of the understanding is let's take a look at that and and then with the possibilities of using it as as um, and right now I think Steve, you can speak to the beam. Yeah, there's a steel beam that's sticking out there, but there is uh, like a masonry chimney that's standing on top of that, you know. So it looks like there's a steel beam hanging out there in midair, but there's about a four foot square masonry chimney sitting on top of that beam, running up the full length of the building, full height of it. So you can't pull that beam out, or that's going to come top of that. That's part of the surgical removal we need to do. We need to take that down carefully, and once that's down, then that steel beam can be taken out of the way. So in that area is, of course, the wall and, and the slab. They were thinking, you know, why take it out if, if there's a potential for a commercial kitchen and, and showers in the future? Maybe making sure in the design that that is stubbed in, because why not stub it in now? May not have to be used, but why demo things to do future work? So this is what we're talking about. So. If there is, if it's something that can be stubbed in and then prepared, um, and then um, in the meantime be used as part of the landscaping plan, potentially, uh, you know, it's there. It's a patio, could be the retaining wall. You know, how can that fit into the um, um, landscaping budget? You know, so we're trying to think ahead, not keep it static. But what are what 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 could we do now to, to control future costs? And how can we make it a, a community building that has in its small little self right now with our limited budget, how can we make it um, usable and, and have opportunity there? That's, that was the committee's thought process. And so we're in, in the throes of that right now, meeting with the design team, looking, with the opportunity, looking at what the opportunities are, 
the um, construction manager is looking at all of our suggestions. We've made many. You know, what's the primary purpose of the building now? What and you know, what can it be for the next several years? And what are the opportunities? And we have a very strict budget to work with. Um, we have Chris. Um, you want to speak to about Sarah with yeah. her grant? Oh, yeah. Um, just one other quick thing. Uh, when we were at, Don and I were on the reuse committee, and Tim had said that at some point, you know, there's a lot of federal money out there for warming centers that could be used in cases of emergencies. And that's something I've always had in the back of my mind, and Tim was right about that, because um, the uh, Melanie Hall was supposed to be one, but I don't think they have shower facilities in there. And we talked to the architect and we said, you know, the seller, and we didn't realize this, but when they tore down that wing, we realized that there was a daylight seller into the, comes the original um, Monmouth Academy. Um, so we think it's important to keep that open and keep it a daylight seller, which will get another fire exit. We could put showers down there. We could utilize that for something in the future that whole space could be used for more than what the architect had planned for, with just one stairwell or stairway. Um, so this opens up a whole new opportunity. Um, speaking about Sarah and fundraising, I've been with the Monmouth Museum for 40 years now, and we've raised money through grants, but grants are often issued only once a year. And uh, you've got to really be prepared and get your grant in on time. And Sarah wanted to try to get a $25,000 grant from the Stephen and Tabitha King Foundation, but we weren't at the stage where we could define to the foundation what exactly we needed the money for. So Sarah was very frustrated. She said, what am I going to do? She said, you know, the next time we can apply for money is in October. And I said, well, let's just wait till October and apply then. I think our chances of getting the money would be much greater. So there is a chance of getting $25,000 in October. Uh, other grants, the Davis Foundation, buildings have to be on the National Register of Historic Buildings. Um, the Belvedere Foundation, the same. And, uh, and I do want to say Chris has been contacting people to see if they would donate money. We're talking about having um, the bell tower, you know, refurbished and then getting donations for that and then having a list of, of donors. Um, similar to like what they have at um, the, the medical center, DFD Russell Medical Center. So Chris has been working like crazy. I mean, blankets, has everyone ordered their blanket yet with Monmouth Academy on it? So Chris is really, I tell you, that woman has been working all the time and thinking all the time. She was selling vegetables, which doesn't bring in much money, but she is really working. And Sarah is really working. But getting the grants, you really have to have your ducks in a row and you have to be ready to get it in on time. And they needed a, a more uh, confirmed design. They did, yes. Which we just weren't ready to do. Still is nailed down. Exactly. Our design is still in flux depending upon cost. Mm -hmm. You know, what the in engineers and people are working on now is to give us a preliminary cost of how much we can do with our budget because our budget is finite. We can't go back to the well for more money. So, if we have this much money, we're going to do everything we can. But if we don't have enough money to do a certain portion, you know, like one thing we were talking about is possibly like air conditioning to maintain humidity levels and stuff like that. You know, that's one item that we're talking we'd love to have if we can afford it. If we can't afford it, then that was something we may not be able to do. So we'll get to the, with the existing funds that we have, we'll get to the point where the, the structure that's left is weather weatherproof the is stable the, the oh, yeah. remaining foundation is stable and we'll have the the ability to maintain a, a, an adequate temperature control so the building won't deteriorate whether it's occupied or not right and i think our goal is if i'm not mistaken mm -hmm. to make it usable obviously right. well obviously it is but yeah. it, 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 to go beyond just having it sit there yeah. the goal is to is to really in whatever way we can within the budget to make it, you know, maybe available for, you know, we can vote there as opposed to trying to negotiate with the, you know, time with at the high school. You know, there's there's things that it can be used for. The primary goal, of course, is to bring it to what you're saying. 
Right, right. we have to do that because mm -hmm. otherwise it's money wasted. Absolutely. Exactly. But it should also be usable. If we can do that. But, and I agree that, you know, I'm, I'm in, a, in a large business myself and, and we were talking just about our, our diesel fuel spend has oh, more yeah. than doubled in the last 18 months. And so every contractor faces the same kind of things. Labor has gone up, materials have gone up out of sight, you know, sometimes more than 50%, you know. In, in so the idea that we're going to get what we thought we'd get done for the money we have shouldn't be anybody's expectation. No, no. But we're going to try to get every opportunity that we can to get as close as we can right. with, you know, really organizing our opportunities in such a fashion that gets us as close to that finish line as possible. Right. So just from my perspective, my my expectation is that we'll be able to, as I said, be able to have the everything secured and the building in a, in a position where it's not going to deteriorate. If the roof's not going to leak, walls aren't going to deteriorate yeah, because they're exposed yeah. to you know uh, freezing and then warming and, and all that kind of and, stuff. And we think we've got enough budget to do that and, and a little more at this point. But like we said, they're still doing cost estimates and stuff like that. So hopefully within the next meeting or two, we'll have those ironed out as to how much money they think it's going to be with the X. Hopefully, we got enough to go right. Y. You know, that's the goal. Well, and, and I, I like the way that you're approaching this. You don't start Y unless you have the money to complete Y. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no because Y might be best served. You know, can't do the whole thing being divided into two Ws. Right. So, we'll just use hypothetical numbers. We'll say that the the project that you want to the last project you want to complete. Would cost three hundred thousand dollars, and you only have one hundred and fifty. Then you leave that one hundred and fifty in the bank, unless you had another useful purpose unless for it. Unless there's another useful purpose. Yeah. And and then when we were able to come up with the additional funds to complete that piece of the project, we complete it. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like so much about Nixon O'Day. And as a subcontractor, I work with them. Not on this type of building, we primarily do new construction, but. Um, that's their expertise. The, the group that they have working with us um, have worked on, and I can actually give you a copy, I brought a copy of their, um, yeah, sure their main forte seems to be yeah. value engineering. I'm sorry, yes. It, so they go through that's what they do. the most they can get for the value. Right. And they're, as I say, the cost estimating um, software. <laughs> it looks like I have something I can do. So for me personally, it's twofold. But their their expertise um, with this in working with groups like us, you know, townspeople and whatnot who have passion for whether it's a meeting hall or whatever, um, that they can't do all at once. They, you know, they're a, not a one and done kind of company. Matter of fact, um, they they just um, converted to um, employee owned, so the people in the company have a lot vested in doing the they, projects. They showed us a project that they worked on for over ten years. Yeah. You know, every time they could raise some money, they go a little further down the project right. every every year or two, and they finally completed the total yeah. project yeah. in a ten year time. Come. Uh, July 1st. What do you see as having occurred? Well, that will we'll have a better idea about um, with our next meeting because the next meeting is talking about the budget and the you know and the opportunities. Because of course you're going to have to buy out the different scopes. You're going to have to get requests. Um, we have to get bids. From the different, you know, engineers and you know, they have engineers on staff, but they have electricians and masons and things like that. So it's going to be a process, but they they want to focus on making sure that the building is, you know, we, they've heard that it's an eyesore in, in the process. They want to address that right out of the gate. And another thing that they're proposing is their drawings. They're going to install a sign, as many do on their projects. You know, you go to any large project, you're going to see a sign of all the, the general contractor and all the subs and what the building is going to look like. 
they're going to do renderings and they will also provide you know any updated plan views meaning what's on the inside of the building like you're looking down from through the roof to see what the what the rooms will look like and what they're proposing so that should be within the next i would say month or so oh that yeah next. i would think so i would think they have it. july 1st well it's still be an eyesore that's we we can answer that's a great question doug and i will ask that because i don't know what their time frame is because we don't they their contract just arrived for them monday okay, okay. so they got started on it and now that their contract has arrived, um, they will be taking that information that they've already worked on with the estimating, with our discussions that we had at our last meeting, which included getting a sign out and making sure that the tail end of the building doesn't look like it just, you know, went through a war. Okay, we, so, we understand that. And I, but I can't tell you right now, Doug, if it's going to be completed, but that is one of the first things that they will be working on. So, so come, uh... Maybe November, winter is coming. It'll oh, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll have it. Yeah, I'm sure. But by fall, obviously, we'll have it all closed in, and hopefully, we'll have some sort of heat in the building to maintain temperature. I mean, the building structurally is in fantastic condition for its age. You know, the roof rafters, all that kind of stuff, seems to be great, even though it's got a stone foundation under a lot of it. I mean, there's minor rot and a few beams, floor beams down underneath that we may have to address, but all in all, for its vintage, it's very good condition, I think. So, so if, if for maybe couch people to look at it uh, come November, they'll be able to see, wow, it's turning into Coming, coming along, yes, yeah. Ab mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we don't want it to sit in this current condition any longer than necessary, you know, this, this is the opportunity to bring it to the exterior. And again, I, they're already, um, and we'll have more information when we, when we get to talk um, to them um, in the next week, because our next meeting is on Tuesday. But this is a document that was passed around, um, not only, it's called the Design Narrative, and it's not only um, um, the civil engineering and electric, electrical and mechanical and whatnot, it's also from the architecture point of view. And within several days, we have you know four pages worth of this is what we want to do. These are the windows that we're thinking about. These are the different mechanical items that we're thinking about. And this document went back to the reason where they presented it. Um, their cohorts um, and partners in crime added their their wish their wish lists and their thoughts, and this will is back with them now. That's starting to starting to put numbers with it. Where these windows work, well, you know, and, and they want to hold through to the vintage of the building with honoring the fact that it needs to be you know affordable to operate. So you know it's. The wheels are turning, and and Doug, if you you know here at all of our meetings, you'll see this next meeting on Tuesday. We'll really start to see some, you know, some some concrete. Well, they're they're supposed to have, you know, we've been going back and forth with different designs, and we kind of picked out a preliminary design. Now they're doing cost estimating on that design right. to see if it falls within our budget. Right. If you know if they think it's going to fall within our budget, then we'll go with that design. If they say, if they come back with a cost estimating saying we can't do that, then we got to redesign it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of a, a give and take at this point until we get some concrete pricing and, and get everything nailed down. It's still in flux. You know, and when Chris gets back, she obviously comes to your meetings and our meetings both. So she's hopefully will be able to be our liaison to report to all of your meetings. You know, and if you have any questions, she can bring those to us and we can formulate the proper answers. So we know, you know, if you have concerns, anything like that, she can bring those to us. We can get the appropriate answers Absolutely. back to you at the next meeting. Yeah. Um, both the design guys and uh, construction managers actually are representative um, from uh, Nick Smith Daly's right now. 
So easy access. Um, Paul, I think, I think his business is located in Portland, but I think he's is he local. I think he lives in the Muslim area. So we have people that we're working with that are close by. And, and, and are happy to answer questions. I think, from my perspective, this has been very helpful having them here mm -hmm. and giving explanations. Uh, we'll see if there are any other questions yes. before we finish. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. I think it would also be helpful if, at at some point, as the project uh, gets further along, that we get the whole committee back to sit down like this. So, because it's great to have. Can, we can give questions to Chris, Chris can give back answers, but it's great to have feedback back and forth. Absolutely. Well, one of the things when I talked to Chris um, the other day, well, actually again today, is what we will do is put on our agenda, um, not only a, an agenda item asking, you know, informing her, these are the things that they should know about. Let's get that information out quickly. But also an item saying, hey, ask specifically at your meetings, you know, every select board meeting, what in, what information are you guys looking for? And certainly, I, I agree. I think you know, getting together on a you know periodic basis would be very helpful. Communication is key. So, um, so maybe we could plan uh, like a September get yeah. together again because we should be a lot closer to oh, absolutely. It. certainly. Yeah, I, I think by then we should definitely have. Hard and fast plans and cost mm -hmm. estimates, um, so that we can be underway. I'm hoping by then. Oh, absolutely. That's that's the goal. You know, and again, it's a moving target because of many factors that are outside of our control. Um, you know, watching the budget, but they're as I say, they're estimating um, equipment that we present. They give a value of importance. What's the roof, windows, blah blah blah. What are the and those values are at the top. And then the options to accomplish those values, and then they're just weighted that way. And it's, I think it's going to be a very interesting process. Right. You have to have heat. You have to be able to dehumidify because those are the mm -hmm. extreme temperature fluctuations and humidity destroy all wood buildings. Oh, I know. And yet there it is. It's the craziest <laughs> thing, you know. Yeah. yeah. I. I'm sorry. I like old buildings better than new buildings. And my thought is, will the memorial school still be here 166 years from now? Probably not. <laughs> Just saying. I work in masonry. I was I was first Luther on that project. <laughs> but, but likely that won't be the case. This place is remarkable, and that's why it bothers me to think that it could have been torn down. I'm I'm not I'm not as passionate about it as Lori Gifford, who says that she would strap herself to the wrecking ball. <laughs> but but you know, and, and we have we have I know in town. It would have bounced off her. <laughs> <laughs> but that so that's that's the deal is is in any time, you know, we will now that I know um how vital it is because communication is key. I raised a teenage girl, so I did that. Um but communication can can solve a lot of problems. So at any time, our agenda and our next meetings are posted on the town website. We would love to have anybody come. You know, um, Doug has been our public, done a great mm -hmm. job being our public, but anybody's welcome to come because um, if you want to see what the most recent designs are, the most recent thoughts, you're welcome. There's been a question about uh, payment regarding the Scott Perot and the Almighty oh, Ways. I can bring you up to date on that. Okay. Okay. Um, the demo was scheduled to be done so that we had a jump on this because when it comes into building season, people like that hold up. If they aren't accessible, if you can't get them, our projects, our part of the projects will start. So we felt that if we're, we're the ones that are in construction and we want the best to get that taken care of. And I think it was a very good move. Um, however, my understanding, I did not understand the dynamics of, because I've stayed out of this kind of thing for the 30 of the 35 years that I've been here. So I was under the assumption, and you know what happens when you assume, that that was being taken care of um, in a similar fashion to a prior administration to a new, the new administration. That didn't happen. So I did not know. And it's my responsibility. I should have. I should have asked. Um, 
you know, we, we need to be seeing the payments. We need to be seeing the bills. And um, so the first three payments were issued. The final one has not been. In the contract, if I have a copy of in the contract, it speaks to what we call retainage. Retainage is a percentage held to make sure that the work is done satisfactorily. Okay, and then, and then it, there has to be agreement that it can be released. Unfortunately, the first repayment did not withhold the retainage. So they've been paid three quarters of the contract. The final payment has not been issued yet. I've asked Justin to check with the attorney to make sure, uh, because of the wording of the contract, um, I, my recommendation to the committee, and we haven't met yet, but my recommendation to the committee is that that final payment withhold the 10%. Entirely, the ten percent of their subcontract. Okay, that's what is correct. However, the wording of that contract was a little different than what I've seen in the contracts that I had to sign. So I want to make sure that that's something that we can do. The the other possibility would be that it would only be ten percent that the ten percent retainage of the final payment. So I'm waiting to hear from that. Justin has requested clarification on that from Mary, um, but. What we'll do is when we speak with the design team and the construction manager on Tuesday, we will assess the situation and make recommendations um, whether to complete paying the 90% of their contract or if we're obligated to pay all but that last 10% of that last check. I, I have an update. She sent it to me just before we came down she here. Did. So you will see in that warrant, I retained 10% of the total amount because the, the next payment is in that thing. So the, that the ten percent of the total project amount has been retained out of the payment that's in Excellent. the warrant. That's good. Yes. Mary says that she thinks that she could defend that we could hold that whole that whole amount, but to be careful, I, I kept it anyway. Right, and, and that and that's why I didn't want to step out yeah. because I didn't, you know, who needs an army? Right. So, um, yeah. but that is the right thing, and Almighty Waste really doesn't have anything to complain about because it's a subcontractor. I never get you know one hundred percent of my payments are yeah. paid. So they've they've enjoyed, you know, three months of, of getting paid to one hundred percent of requisition of that time. So and what we're going to do in the future is, as the invoices come into me, that they're going to be sent to the committee. They will tell me what to pay, when to pay it. So I'm not just going to just be paying invoices for this project as they come into the town right. office. So we've 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 communicated that yeah. process going forward. We're ultimately responsible. Yes. yes. So we are the ones that would recommend to you guys. Okay. Yeah. So That's, how, how are we going to? Uh, we're going to report that to you after our meeting. Okay. Get that all figured out for you. <laughs> okay. So, and I won't put any invoices in front of you unless I've been told they're okay to pay yeah. from them too. Just so you know. So uh, will we see, not in here necessarily, but uh, a, a paper saying that. Uh, explaining it, what is in there for, that we're paying, and we're if we're not, we're not going to go through this. You know, I assume the committee is going to have to communicate that to me somehow. So an email would be good enough, and I can supply that to, to you folks if that's if that's how you want to see it. So how how requisitions work? Okay, is the construction manager from this point forward? I think there will be billing, obviously, for the design team to be separate. Um, and I have a copy of that too, and I, I'm assuming that we should be even doing that as well. Um, but we'll talk about that on, on, on the fourth. But what the construction manager is going to do for us, Doug, is, is each one of the trades that are working during that month give us uh, what we call a requisition. It's not a bill. They give us a requisition which says percentage of completion. Okay. Now that could be percentage of completion for materials alone. It could be percentage of completion for labor and equipment. A schedule of values for each trade is provided to the construction manager. Now, now uh, a bricklayer can say I'm 50% complete, but only 25% of that is physically on the building, the rest is material. That's how you can tell. And at a glance, generally speaking, a walk around the building, you can kind of thumbnail. You know, yeah, the drywallers are about, you know, 30% done. No, I'm not going to pay 40%. Oh, okay, I see the rest of it is they bought material ahead. Those are all broken out, and that's what we'll see. And 
that's what we'll be able to show you guys. That if you know that if we say the building is 50% done, it may be 100 percent done in one area and none in the other, but it's all broken up by the schedule values. Mm -hmm. That's other, I see one question here. I'm wondering if there are other questions from folks in the Okay, so uh, I heard through the grapevine that the sewer was just broken up and wasn't uh, properly kept. Has that been taken care of? That's a Paul Luke question, and I will get that answer for you. And uh, I walked that building last night, and I think the security is terrible. It wasn't even the doors were not locked. And uh, I think uh, if we're going to have this thing sitting in our backyard for the next three months, four months, before anything happens, that we need to make sure the doors are locked on the building so that uh, some little kid doesn't go in there and light a fire, because then we'll have a mess. Which door are you referring to? The last time I was up there, there were cable locks on the doors. Is, is, well, there, is there one that's open? Cable locks or not, because I don't see those. Okay. But the basement door is in the old boiler room, it's uh, it is open. Okay, let me we'll, we'll take a look at that. Well, that, that brings up uh, someone had asked about the construction. And, and that was a question that I asked um, Jeff Lewis about the construction manager. That is part of their RFP. Now, some people um, would say there's no need, so it's a line item, it's not an unanticipated cost. It's a cost that we can choose to include in the project or not. And so, you know, I that's part of the discussion that we're going to be having. So, you know, does the town have, you know, construction fencing that we own that could help? Yay, that's great. If not, it's not an unanticipated cost. It's in there. But could we control costs by having access to others? I don't know. That's that's a conversation that, that we can have. Either way. You know, the, the property can be secured, the fencing, whatever most construction sites are. Well, I think we're at the present time, you know, upstairs on the second floor, those doorways need to be blocked shut. Okay, make sure every door is. I, I think it's a waste of money to spend on fence right now because the fence is not going to stop everybody, they're just going to jump over. So your your thoughts are the Get building, the building is secure. Mm -hmm. Board up what you you know the, any open that around that building board up. Even if it's on the second floor, because you know oh, yeah. the kids are shimmy up there. And uh, you know but we really I, need to, I would just think we need to really fence in any open areas. Like if we haven't capped the foundation or we haven't there's a hole someplace we need to fence that in and go. Well, I didn't see any of the doors can fence. You already had that fence, so we can't jump off that retaining wall. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, you got enough fence right there. I just think there's some yeah. openings that need to be the, boarded up. But the other thing to consider is, is, and I think this would be good for you to look into, to uh, get with our attorney on is, is uh, uh, defending liability. So if we don't put up construction fencing and somebody accesses the property just walking around the building and they get hurt, they trip on a block or they want to step in a hole and break their ankle, that kind of thing. Maybe they have a particular set of requirements that they would need to meet. Right, exactly. So our, our insurance, the town's insurance, needs to be consulted about what we do and don't do to secure the site. Yeah. I thought the were really, really good. Right, but that doesn't mean we aren't still have well, a liability risk. Still liability. Right. So, be some, should be some no trespassing fine. Well, whatever our insurance, whatever our insurance carrier deems as as the necessary thing is what we should go by. It's not, it's certainly not what I think or anybody else thinks, but what our insurance yeah. company says: this is your this is your risk. This is the best way to manage the risk. And then you do a cost benefit on what level of risk you're willing to accept at what cost. Yeah, I'm sure. Last thing I had, I will actually do that. Uh, did the oil tanks get gone? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that they, because uh, uh, I've never seen them sitting around up there. 
So I don't know if they dug them out or not. I hope that they're not still in the no, ground. I can't imagine, but we can confirm. I, I thought Linda had that all taken care of when she was still there, because I know she had somebody come in and remove the, the yes, oil. oil. There was oil left over in the tanks, mm -hmm. but I thought the tanks were removed, but I didn't physically see that. The tanks are still in the ground. The demo didn't include the movement of tanks. That was going to be done by some arts. The tanks are still in the ground. Oh, some arts. Okay. okay. Yeah, because that's have a licensed tank installed. How many ways they can't they can't take those tanks off the ground. Right? Okay. But they're empty. We, we were told that they were empty. They, they there's less than a, there's less than two inches of product left for that. Really? Okay. Yeah. My company came and took it away for nothing. So yeah. instead of paying 99 cents a gallon to right. get rid of it, we came and took care of it. Okay. Good, thank you. Yes. I forgot the other question. <laughs> uh, the reason Don was so adamant about getting that 10 percent retainer from all my waste was to take care of any future expenses on the uh, sewer system. I don't know anything about the way the town pays, but I wouldn't pay any contract. I've seen you always hold 10. I've seen 50 of them. Oh, have you? Sometimes when I was the GC, I held more than. Right. And, 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 and because and I wanted to have my fingers so they would do something. Mm -hmm. If I made a phone call to them, you want to have some leverage. Right. And, 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 again, and lots of times the 10% isn't enough because it's no leverage at all. They'll just walk away from the 10%. So you got to, as people that pay, you got to look at that and see what you want to do. But 10% is really tiny. Well, it depends on the amount, the gross amount too. So, yeah. if you're if you're good, if the town is contractually obligated to pay at a certain amount, then we don't have an option to slip our finger on no, no, money. No. You're, you're we got to pay to the contract. You're not yeah. obligated until you sign that contract. The contract you is that on the contract. The contracts were signed. Yeah. Contracts were okay, signed. So you have to go on this one by what was signed. That's right. I'm telling you in the future. Yeah, you you put in there, you uh, fix that line. Well, well let you have it, adequate control. What what in the process that we plan on using, which is a process that our company has to go through, we, we are subject to it, let's say on a regular basis, you know, in DC. Um, I can submit a bill saying that I want this much money. And it's the committees. The owners, the architect's decision whether or not you're entitled yeah. that you've done enough work to warrant mm -hmm. that payment. So just because somebody submits a payment, a, a, a draw, doesn't mean that that's what you're going to get. Well, no, I'm just pointing yeah. that out because I know how uh, some things get paid right on the check. You can go. So, so that's why you wanted to grab and, and understand what the contract said. Because again, the wording was a little clunky compared to what I'm accustomed to. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know legally, and I'm a lawyer. Um, and since they rule the world, it, you know, it, it was, thank you for checking. It, it's important, you know, we, we don't need to have almighty ways come back and, and uh, cause issues. Again, they, I'm sure they were happy to get the full um, amount of their, of their jobs, so. But I'm glad that we can retain it. It was a reasonable, reasonable amount to retain for the size of the Yeah, very the standard. Standard. Yeah. I see another question. Yeah. I just one question. I'm sometimes both thick. But basically, what I heard, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to summarize it and correct me if I'm wrong the money that taxpayers voted on to spend to get this building done, whatever, may or may not be usable at the end. We're going to seal it up. We're going to put some heat in it. It may or That's may not. not the goal. That may not be the goal. But come on, let's get freaking real with the taxpayers. We're going to have to go back to the well. What are we going to use it for? What, what's the building's use? No one can tell me what we're going to use this place for. Although we're going to have heat in it. It's going to look like it used to look in 18 whenever. We don't know at this point until we get the cost estimates back. And, and again, Steve, trust me, I deal with, I'm in a big company and I deal with big construction projects. Mm -hmm. You know? And I'm looking at this as we're a million bucks short to make it so it's something worth doing something with. You know, we're talking about, well, they're going to have a, a stairway up through the, the walk out the back. 
And where's the elevator cost? It's 20,000 bucks with an elevator in. Got to have an ADA accessible, correct? Yes, we do. Can't say no, we don't. Yes, if we're going to put a stairway and go out the back, it has to be ADA accessible, just like this one. Can I have an elevator in it? That's $200,000. That just took a big bite out of our $1.7 million. And those are the considerations that, that we're taking. It, it may may not be that we can do that. Well, and, and, and we've saved part of a foundation that sticks right off that wall. And I'm going to argue with you five feet all day long. You guys decided with your architect or whoever, it doesn't really matter, that maybe further down the road, we're going to add something on. That's not what the townspeople voted to spend money on. That should, wall should have been gone to within five feet, period. End of discussion. So get, stay in your guys' lane, okay? That's all I'm going to say. You guys need to stay in your lane. The taxpayers voted for something. You guys are making decisions. Well, down the road, we might do this. No, we voted to take care of this building, period. Not add on to it down the road to something else. Stay in your lane. Do what the taxpayers voted for. Because two times that I voted on stuff in this town, and I won't refer you back to 2004, when I was a police officer here, the taxpayers in this town voted to keep 24-7 police coverage. And the select board decided we're going to get rid of a guy and we're going to cut back coverage. Most of the taxpayers, and we can sit here with the town manager and say, yeah, there's 4,000 people in town, but there's only 10 people here represented. Well, guess what? I'm speaking up for the people that aren't here. You know, the townspeople voted to do something. All I'm saying is stay in your lane. We're not looking for 30 years down the road. We might add something on. Because right now, that's a safety hazard. Some kid can climb over the damn temporary fence, fall into the basement, and the town owns it. Because we decide, well, yeah, the taxpayers own it. Because we, just, we, your committee, has decided that we want to keep that in case we want to do something else down the road. It wasn't your decision. Taxpayers voted, okay? Stay in your lane. Thank you. There was really no question there. Stay in your lane. And that foundation probably doesn't need to come in. Present day code. So that, that's all I guess. Like, you guys need to stay in your lane. Okay. We, 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 I don't know. So like, here I am. We've got way over. I've got. Well, Mark's going to say that. Maybe we just get Mark. Just, yep. just from what I'm hearing, um, we're, we're going to run out of money, obviously, before we get to where we want to be. Um, and if I was serving on this committee, I would try to make a plan to make it usable with what you have for funds, because the idea of going back to the taxpayers and asking for more funding in the next three to five years, I think is going to be totally out of the question. Um, we've got a dam yeah. on the lake that's probably going to require hundreds of thousands of dollars, I'm going to guess, to repair. Um, and with the cost of everything going up, um, going back and asking people to pay more taxes. Um, you know, for, and I, I think to, to your point, sir, I'm a taxpayer. I get it. You know, and and real, and I would like to have the building usable. That's my goal. And that's why I've chosen who we chose to do the value engineering. That's not what was voted on. And I'll just say, as you look I, around this town, this town is kind of a bedroom community. There are a lot of old people here in I this understand. town on fixed incomes. I, and I, and I, I pay hear. $700 for less than an acre of grass I mow to make my lawn look pretty. So I don't want to pay $1,000 to have a piece of grass up from the house like I can mow so that I can have to go look, drive by a building up town that we have no intent. Right today, tell me what the building is going to be useful. There was no intended use. You guys have no idea. Yet we voted to spend 1.7 million because everybody's grandmother and grandfather and great great grandfather went there and we all thought with our hearts and not our pocketbooks. So you guys gotta, we gotta stop the bleed. We have this building here, another great big architectural thing for the town. Cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and we can use it for whatever, right? Show me when this addition was built. It was all said, well, we can rent it out. We're going to generate income for the town. Show me since 2000, whatever this was built, two or three, how much money this has generated for the town? Nothing. Nobody can show me that number because it's generated nothing. So don't sit there and tell me something on Academy Road is going to be a big income generator for the town. I just don't see it right. I like old buildings too. But you know what? In reality, Chris, $400,000 for the town to flatten that whole mess and make a play park would have been a few lot better investment. Yeah, we do. We do. We will. Two million to no. I'll leave because I'm just going to lose my money. <laughs> All of it. Keep both sides standing. Yeah. Uh, 
you said Chris had a yes. So if I could get a word in edgewise, these are all conversations we've had at the committee meetings. These are open meetings. People can come to these meetings, hear what we have to say. There's a Zoom link for the meetings. We've talked about the fact that we need a place to vote, that we don't have to negotiate with an RSU, that we pay $450,000 a month to ask permission to use the gymnasium. Um, this building will allow us to vote there. It will allow us to generate revenue for meetings, for academy trustees, for Monmouth Alumni Association, for weddings. Um, luckily, we have Dennis Price on staff now to help with generating money at Cumston Hall. Um, that is stuff that never happened before. We've looked at fee schedules. They've been reevaluated. Um, you know, so there's a lot happening. We aren't doing this just to save it because six generations of my family have gone there. We, the majority of people, and I think it, you know, I'd have to go back to the numbers last year, but I think that it was a pretty convincing vote that majority of people wanted to save this. So the people that didn't want to save it, you know, that's what democracy is. So we had voted to save the building. We have a certain amount of money to use. We will only use that amount of money to do what we can right now. If in the future, we do decide we want to do something else, then yes, maybe we'll revisit it. Um, the foundation off where the home economics building was, it proved to us it was always another entrance into that basement. So we can use the entrance that was bricked up into that basement, it had been there for coal or wood or whatever, but there was another entrance. So we can get into the basement without taking up floor space with stairs, because we all know how much stairs take up. And also our architect told us we did not need to spend $100,000 on an elevator because it didn't make sense to spend $100,000 for 900 square feet of space on the second floor. So we chose to use the second floor for mechanicals because it made good financial sense to use the money for a wide open space to have concerts, to have exhibits, to have wedding receptions, to have bridal showers, you know, whatever people want to use that space for. And there's a lack of meeting space in the area. People are always looking for some place, you know, I'm in the world of dentistry and four or five times a year, the main dental association is trying to find a space to host about, you know, a hundred to 300 people for meetings. So, you know, this is a space we'll be able to have open for that. And it will be a beautiful space and it will be historic and it will mean something to me. Um, I don't really care what it means to other people, but it means something to me. So that's why I've made sure um, I've worked hard to try to raise as much money. Um, I don't have that figure. I'd like to be able to see what's been donated. Um, but, um, you know, for each dollar we generate in donations, that 
we only have 1.7, whether it comes 1.7 from donations or 1.7 from taxpayers. That's what we have. So, you know, to say that you're going to carry that burden, the taxpayer, you might not. You might only carry 10% of that as a taxpayer because we might be fortunate enough to generate that in donations. So, you know, I get a little defensive when people start telling us that we're doing something nefarious. We're not. We are using that piece of concrete down there that obviously was there from 1856. That was accessible in 1856. We didn't add it. We didn't save it. We didn't put it there. You know, it was there and we're gonna reuse it. All done, Chris. I'm done. I'm okay. done ranting. <laughs> oh, we're, we're a half hour over that, which was a lot of time. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Keep working hard. We're happy to answer questions anytime. Appreciate it. You know, if there's something that Chris brings to the board after one of our meetings that you know, you have questions about, we're all happy to so you'll adjourn this, Doug. What? You'll adjourn this because it's a joint meeting, and then we'll go into your business meeting. I mean, motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor. And Chris will need to say yes verbally if she's in the game. Yep. Chris. I agree to adjoin the joint meeting.